Uh, so hello everyone once again uh, for this third session of this Tour de France from A to Z. Uh, I'm happy to see you again to present you some new cities. Um, so just as a reminder, uh, this session is being recorded and you will be able to uh, find it uh, on the Princeton Public Library's YouTube channel in just a few days. The first two ones I think are already available. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Emily. I've been working at the library since March 2022. And so, yeah, this is the third session of the Tour de France series. All right. So today we will go with the F, G, and H letters. So Fort de France, Grenoble, and Andai. So today we'll be traveling quite a few thousand kilometers. As you will see, so the first city I'm going to talk to you about is Fort de France, which is located in Martinique, which is uh, one of the overseas territories of France, so located in the Lesser Antilles, so quite a few thousand kilometers away from France, I would say like maybe 8,000, something like that, so quite far away. Uh, so Fort de France is the biggest city of Martinique, as I said, in the Lesser Antilles. Um, so France colonized this island uh, in the 17th century, and in the process of colonization, they actually almost exterminated the uh, Kalinago people, who were the native people from Martinique before French people arrived. Uh, so yeah, in 1658, most of the Galinago people uh, were basically expulsed from the city. The few survivors uh, migrated to uh, other islands in the Lesser Antilles, and now uh, the, population, the population is mostly French and uh, descendants of slaves who were uh, brought to Martinique uh, during slave trade since the 1640s. If you ever heard about uh, writer and poet Aimé Césaire, he was the mayor of the city from 1944, sorry, 1945 to 2001. So um, along with French Guyanese Léon Damas and Léopold Sédor Senghor, uh, who became uh, president of Senegal a few years later, they uh, together founded the Negritude movement, so which was a Francophone literature movement. And so, yeah, Amy Césaire was Martinican and mayor of Fort de France for 56 years. Uh, so from a colony, Martinique became a department of France in 1946. And now it has a uh, different status. Uh, again, uh, it's now called a, spe a special collectivity. It's, so it, it lost its uh, colony status to become a department and, not, and now it's not a department anymore, it's a special collectivity. And so in Martinique, uh, Antillean Creole is widely spoken. Uh, so what can you see in uh, Fort de France and around Fort de France? So for this session about Martinique, I'm cheating a bit in the sense that I'm not going to talk about things that you can see in Fort de France alone, but across the whole island. Um, I have actually traveled to this island a few times, so I'm sharing with you some places I've been to and that I really enjoyed, including this one, the Balada Garden. Uh, so as you can see, so Fort de France is basically located over here, and Balata Gardens are a bit north of uh, the city. <clears throat> so the Balata Garden was initiated by horticulturist and landscape designer Jean-Philippe Doze in 1982. And so this garden that he um, that he conceived, he conceived it uh, at the back of his uh, family Creole house. Uh, so it opened to the public since uh, 1986. And so over there, you can see about 3,000 varieties of exotic plants and flowers from all over the world. I've seen in this garden some flowers uh, of colors I've never seen before, and that was really pretty. And if you feel like it, you can take a suspended trail in the trees to visit the park, which I did not do because I'm very afraid of heights. So yeah, this is an example of the vegetation that you can see uh, in the park and as well of the suspended trail uh, that you can 
take if you're not like me, not afraid of heights. So like yeah, over there, uh, you can find some palm trees, orchids, hibiscus, uh, flamingo flowers, uh, bromeliads, and thousands of other kinds of flowers, tropical and from um, other countries as well. All right, the second place I went to and that I really enjoyed as well was the Habitation Clément. So the story of this place starts in 1887 when a businessman and the first black doctor of Martinique, Omer Clément, bought a 400-acre estate at this time called the Acajou Estate. There, he built this theory in 1917, which was actually active until uh, 1988. And so even though the distillery is not uh, active anymore, some of the activities related to rum distillery still happen uh, on site. Um, the bottling of, uh, the, uh, of rum is still happening at the Habitation Clément. Uh, and as well, they kept the aging cellars, so the rum is still kept over there for it to age. So the rum run uh, was actually developed after World War I by Omer Clément's children. First, it was called the Acajou Rum and was rebranded later in the 1940s as the Clément Rum. <clears throat> so a fun fact about this place is that George Bush and uh, President François Mitterrand met there on March 14, 1991, uh, after um, the, the end of the Gulf War. Um, so this place from distillery was turned into a museum and contemporary art center by its new owners in the early 2000s. So now the place doesn't belong to the Clément family anymore. It belongs to the Bernard Ayo uh, Group Company, uh, which bought the estate in 1986. So this group actually renamed uh, the estate, which, as I said, was first called the Acajou Estate, uh, into the Habitation Clément uh, to pay tribute to Omer Clément. So this place uh, attracts about 100,000 uh, visitors per year since its opening to the public in 2003. So there are a lot of places, uh, a lot of different spaces that you can visit when you uh, go to the Habitation Clément. So you can visit the main house over there as well as the outbuildings. Uh, there's a huge park uh, with botanical gardens that you can see over here, and it's way bigger than that. It's just that I I didn't have a panoramic view of the um, uh, of the gardens, but so yeah, some uh, contemporary art centers uh, and other spaces, and so as well as the distillery became uh, a like the distillery itself became a rum interpretation center uh, the, and the fermenting room was transformed into an exhibition space for contemporary arts. So like, yeah, this is the, the picture of uh, François Mitterrand and George Bush meeting in 1991. And like, yeah, this is an example of the, the barrels of rum with the Habitation Clément stamp that you can see. And so at the end of the visit, I should add that you can have a free tasting of uh, the rums uh, or made by Habitation Clément, which are very good. Uh, so like, yeah, it's good to try if you don't drive, very important. Uh -huh. And so uh, another fun fact about this place is that Aimé Césaire, who I mentioned before, uh, while he was uh, still mayor of Fort de France, uh, planted a coal barrel tree, so uh, an, 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 sorry, an endemic tree of Martinique in the botanical garden of the Habitation Clément. All right. So as well, I want to mention uh, the Memorial Cap 110, its full name is Memorial Cap 110 Memory and Fraternity. Uh, so this is um, a very big sculpture uh, that was created by artist Laurent Valère from Martinique. So what it represents is 15 figures who are facing the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Guinea, from where most of the slaves were coming from during slave trade. Um, and so, yeah, they measure each uh, eight feet high, about 2.5 meters, uh, 
They are about five feet large and they each weigh about four tons. So they form a triangle to represent the triangle, the triangle of trade of slaves. So from Europe to Africa to the Americas and, and so on. Uh, and so it was commissioned by the city of Le Diamant and inaugurated on May 22nd, 1998 on the uh, anniversary of the 150th birthday of the abolition of slavery in France. Um, so it's been created as a tribute to the slaves who perished in a shipwreck at Anscafa, uh, so over there in the night of April 8th to April 9th, 1830. What happened was that, so in that night, a clandestine slave trafficking boat struck the rocks uh, of the Anscafar, killing nearly a third of those who were on board, who were uh, mostly slaves. 86 people were saved, who were all slaves, and 46 bodies were found the day after, 42 slaves and the four uh, traffickers of slaves. So by creating this, uh, this piece of art, the artist wanted to pay tribute to the victims of that shipwreck and more broadly to all the victims of slave trade. And so the last place I want to talk to you about uh, in Martinique is the Montagne Pelé, so the Pelé Mountains. So it's an active volcano. Its last eruption was in 1932. It culminates at 1371 meter around uh, 1500 feet and so it's located uh, quite north of the island uh, over there so uh, if you're fit enough uh, you can try to climb it uh, and there are three hiking trails to go to the top but so, yeah I've, I haven't tried that uh, but so, yeah I've heard that it's quite a difficult hike and uh, and I think like, yeah, the, the picture is uh, is quite optimistic because most of the time you would have some uh, clouds and you are not so sure that you will have a, a nice view over the, the rest of the island. But still, like if you're looking for a, a challenge, you can you can definitely try it. Uh, so as you can see, the Montagne Pole is overlooking uh, on the bay and over Saint-Pierre. So this city was rebuilt after it was completely destroyed uh, in the 1902 eruption of the Montagne Pelée. Uh, so during the eruption, about 30,000 uh, people died and there were only two survivors of this eruption, including one person who was saved because he was in jail. If you are uh, looking for resources uh, to read about this event, you can uh, check The Day the World Ended by Gordon Thomas and Max Morgan Witz, which was published in 1969 and is available on Hoopla, or Texaco by Patrick Chamoiseau, published in 1992, and which is available at the library as well in English. So Martinique's uh, main cultural events is the carnival. So the carnival is a very big event that happens uh, every year, uh, the week before Lent from Sunday to Wednesday. And it, it carries with it a mix of European and African cultural traditions. So during those, those four days of festivities, uh, you have, you can hear music, you can see parades in the streets, uh, and each day uh, you have a parade with a different theme. So for example, on, on Sunday, um, so on Sunday, people would actually get this giant puppet out, which is called King Vaval. Um, so the king of the carnival, basically. So they would take, take it out to like parade with him in the streets. Usually this giant puppet uh, caricatures either uh, a specific person, but more and more it tends to caricature uh, like a controversy or some quite recent news. Um, the day after on Monday, uh, you would have the mock wedding parades with uh, men dressed as brides and women, as, uh, women dressed as grooms in a burlesque funny way. Uh, and on Tuesday, the Red Devil Parade, where people are dressed like devils, like wearing uh, red uh, outfits and masks. And on Wednesday, uh, on Ashes Day, 
uh, there's a parade where people um, walk in black and white costumes and it's the day where this giant puppet King Vavel uh, dies by fire. Uh, so this carnival is also a good opportunity uh, to discover uh, Danmie, which is a Martinican martial art um, that actually finds its root uh, in the countries of Africa where the slaves uh, came from. And it's uh, similar to uh, the Brazilian capoeira. So alongside the carnival in Martinique, Fort de France offer uh, different cultural events like uh, for the France Cultural Festival, which happens during uh, three weeks uh, in July. So it's a festival of performing arts, music, dance. You can see exhibitions as well. You can attend conferences. Um, the performances are done both by Martinican and international artists. Uh, and so in 2023, it will be this 52nd edition. Uh, and so yeah, the highlights of, those of this festival is like a uh, flamboyant show, which is a parade in costume in the street. There you can have a giant, uh, you can attend a jazz night as well. And there's a, a stage um, where a young uh, group perform. Uh, urban. And so you can also try to attend the Tour de Yol, uh, Tour de Yolon, sorry. So uh, the Tour de Yol is the largest sporting event in Martinique. It's a sailing regatta around the island uh, in eight stages and covers 110 nautical miles in total. Uh, this regatta has been organized since 1984. So what is a Yol? So a Yol is a traditional uh, fishing canoe with a large sail. So like you have the canoe here with like a very, very large sail. So funny enough, the, um, they are not round as the, as the name of the event suggests, but they're actually more rectangle square. And so uh, during this event, crews are usually composed of seven to 14 people. Uh, let's talk about food. All right, so <clears throat> acres are very popular all uh, along the Antilles. They are basically small fritters traditionally made with cod, but can also be made of other fishes like prawns. Uh, they can be made of vegetables too. So they are appetizers that are very popular in Martinique and all along the Antilles. Then you have Boudin Creole, which is a blood sausage, uh, which is also an appetizer. So this blood sausage is cooked with spices and hot peppers. I usually don't like blood sausages that much, but I remember that when I tried it when I was in Martinique, actually, the, um, the spices were made it very different from what I, from the ones I had in mainland France. And I really prefer Boudin Creole, that usual blood sausage. Uh, then you have feroz, which can be, uh, so first, which means fierce in English. Uh, so it can be either eaten as an appetizer or you can eat it at breakfast. So it's a mix of mashed avocados with cod, uh, or you can as well mix it with tuna or crab, cassava, olive oil, lime juice, and hot peppers. So it's called fierce because it's very hot. Uh, and then, so we have Caribbean curry, which, uh, which base is uh, curry and bananas. It can be made with lobster, fish, meat, like whatever meat you want. So basically the meat of the fish that of your choice is marinated into coconut milk, curry, and lime juice. And so it can seem fun to have uh, curries in the Caribbean. Uh, but the thing is that, so curry was actually imported by Indians who migrated to the Caribbean uh, to work there after the abolition of slavery. So that's why you can find curry in the Caribbean. Let's talk about liquor pairing. So I know that uh, at the last presentation, I didn't do much 
of wine pairing or talk much about uh, which liquors were produced in the areas I, I mentioned, but this time I will definitely talk about it because there's a lot to talk about. Uh, so as I mentioned before with the Habitation Clément, so Martinique is an, one of the islands that produces rum. And so on the island, you have 10 distilleries uh, that produce rums for about 20 different brands. So I have a question for you. What do you think was the quantity of white rum produced in Martinique in 2020? So you can um, unmute yourself or you can just like give a, give a number. So it's uh, in terms of um, millions of, uh, in terms of millions of, of liters, not number of bottles. So yeah, if you have an idea of the, of the amount of rum that was produced in Martinique in 2020, if you want to write it in the chat or, or just unmute yourself to, to give an answer. Uh, five million, no, it's more than that. All right, I'll. I'll, I'll say it. So it's actually 17 million liters that were produced uh, of rum in Martinique in 2020. So that's a lot of bottles, that's a lot of rum. Uh, so it is actually possible to visit most of those distilleries and it's called spirit tourism. So like, yeah, um, I forgot to mention. So along the, among the different brands uh, of rum produced in Martinique, there are probably uh, one or two that you've heard about. Um, so I mentioned the Clément rum, but there's also St. James, Trois Rivières and many others. And like yeah, two very popular cocktails that you can make with Martinique and rum or Caribbean in uh, more broadly is Tiponche and Planter. So this is Tiponche and this is Planter. So Tiponche is basically made of uh, rum, sugarcane, sugarcane syrup, and lime. And for the Planter, it's a bit different. So this one, you make it with rum, fruit juice, like pineapple, orange, guava, lemon juice, grenadine, sugarcane syrup, and uh, angostura bitters. So both are very popular in the NT uh, in general. All right, so now let's talk about Grenoble. So I know this, I mean, I visited the city quite a few times because uh, I lived in Lyon at some point and my husband was doing his PhD in Grenoble. So I got to visit uh, this city quite a few times. So Grenoble is nicknamed the capital of the Alps. There's about 157,000 inhabitants. If you count only like the, the city itself, if you take the, the urban area, there are more than 400,000 people who live uh, in that area. So Grenoble is located in the historical and cultural region of Dauphiné. So if we take uh, the previous map here, so the Dauphiné historical region covered about that area over here. Uh, and uh, its uh, particularity is that it is surrounded by three mountain ranges, the Vercors, the Chartreuse, and Beldon. And um, according to Stendhal, who was born in Grenoble, so uh, an author um, who lived in the nine, uh, 19th century, he wrote about Grenoble at the end of every street, mountains, and I can definitely tell you that it is true. Everywhere you look when you're in Grenoble, at the end of the street, you will see a mountain. And so Grenoble hosted the Winter Olympic Games in 1968. So to give you a better idea of the location in Grenoble uh, as regard to the mountain, so here you have the city of Grenoble, at the very north, so you have the Chartreuse Range, which starts really uh, directly like uh, north of the city. Sorry, then in the southwest of Grenoble, you can find the Vercor Range, and in the southwest and southeast, sorry, the Beldon Range. 
And so, yeah, this was the view that my husband had from his balcony. So this is pretty nice. Uh, and so from his kitchen, actually, if you were to lean a bit outside of the window, you could see the Verco range mountain. So like, yeah. Um, so this is well done from the living room and you had the Verco from the kitchen. So as Grenoble is surrounded by mountains, I will, uh, of course, talk to you a bit about uh, what you can see in the mountains that surround Grenoble, starting with the Bastille. So the Bastille is a mi military fort that was built in 1592 uh, and was then improved in the first half of the 19th century. So the Bastille is actually this structure right, right here. So quite in the mountain, as you can see. It culminates at 476 meters, so that's a bit more than 1,500 feet. And so when you are at the top of the, of the Bastille, you can actually have a view over the three mountain ranges. And if the weather is clear, not like on this picture, you can even have a glimpse of the Mont Blanc, which is the highest summit of the Alps. So it's located about uh, 70 miles away from Grenoble. So like, yeah, you have to have the perfect conditions to, to see the, the Mont Blanc from the, from the Bastille. So at the top of the Bastille, you can find two museums, the Centre d'Art Bastille, so um, a museum of contempor contemporary art, and the Museum uh, of the Mountain Troops, uh, which pays tribute to the Alpine Rangers of the French army. So uh, if you want to go there, you can either uh, take a hike, it's not too hard, there's like a, a sharp way, but there's also a, a way that's longer, but not so sharp. Or you can take the bubbles that you had on the first picture right there. So it's a cable car that uh, leads you from the city center of Grenoble directly to the top of the Bastille. Uh, so the Bastille is really uh, the most emblematic uh, place that you can go when you are in Grenoble and it attracts more than 600,000 visitors per year. And following uh, standard words to describe the best sea, I haven't the strength to describe the admirable view, which changes every hundred steps that one enjoys from the best sea. So really, if you have the opportunity to go to Grenoble, you should definitely start uh, with the best sea. And so more broadly about the mountains. So the good thing about Grenoble is that you have some trails, uh, hiking trails accessible directly from the city center of Grenoble, or you can take public transportation that will take you uh, a bit further in the mountains. If you have a car in that case, the possibilities are absolutely endless and you can go anywhere you want. So around Grenoble, there are 802, uh, sorry, 820 kilometers of mark trails that stretch to the Vercor and Chartreuse. So like, yeah, a lot of kilometers to, to hike. And so, yeah, if, uh, if you go to the Bastille, then you can go further uh, behind. You have the Mont Jala and the Mont Rachet that you can see over here. So the Mont Jala is a bit hidden, but like, yeah, you have even further possibilities uh, after the best year. Monjala was definitely easier than climbing the Mont Rocher, I can tell you. And so after a nice hike, you can go to Grenoble city center and visit Old Town. So uh, Grenoble city center, like historical center is actually quite uh, small because the city was fortified until the late 19th century. So because of that, the city could like did not expand much. So like yeah, the, you can definitely see the, the limit of the, of the old city center. But the, the nice thing about that is that the, the old city center is mostly composed of pedestrian streets, so you don't have to worry about uh, cars circulating in, in old town. Uh, and so while walking the narrow streets of old town, you can see buildings from the 13th to the 19th century. So there's a cathedral that dates from the 13th century. 
Um, you can see as well some townhouses that were built in the 17th and 18th centuries. And on the other bank um, of the Isar River that I will show you a bit later. Um, so Old Town continued over there as well with like an Italian quarter where you can find a lot of pizzerias. Um, and yeah, so this building right here was the palace of the Parliament of Dauphiné, which was built in the 16th century. Uh, so it became the courthouse from 1800 to actually 2002. So until very recently, it was still used as a courthouse. It's not used for that anymore. Uh, so what I like about Grenoble is that, so here you have a better idea of the, the city. So a good way to recognize the city center is that all the buildings that you have with the red tiles on the roof and this building here, is basically the historic center. And as soon as it's new, you know that it's definitely not the city center anymore. So you have uh, like, yeah. Uh, so this is the Isar River. And so on, on this side of the river as well, you can have some uh, old townhouses that uh, are part of the historical uh, city center of Grenoble. And what I like about Grenoble is that you can feel that you start to be in the south of France because you have very colorful houses. Um, and yeah, it gives you the, the idea that yeah, you're you're closer to, to the south of France. The tiles as well is definitely a good indication that you are getting to the south of France. And finally, so I'm going to tell you about the Saint Laurent Archaeological Museum. So uh, this museum is located at the very uh, bottom of the hill of the Bastille. And so this building itself is uh, very interesting because it's a complex layering of buildings and structures. So first, um, uh, the very uh, at the very beginning, so there was a Gallo-Roman necropolis that dates from the fourth century. Then a crypt was built over this necropolis in the 6th century, and a Roman church was built over uh, that in the 12th century. So that's quite an interesting uh, layers of history that you can find over there. So uh, the archaeological site uh, was ex excavated from 1978 to 1999. And the church, the Roman church, was actually desacralized in order for the uh, archaeology, for the excavation to, to take place and to become an archaeological site. So uh, on this site, more than uh, 1,500 bur burials from uh, the 4th to the 18th century were found, as well as 3,000 objects uh, in the different layers uh, and in the tombs that you can that were found uh, in in the building in the very basement of the building, the good thing about this museum is that it, the entrance is free for everyone, and it's received the label of historic monument on uh, August tenth, nineteen seventy seven. So Grenoble is quite a vivid city and offers quite a few festivals. So here I'm going to talk to you about four of them, starting with the Détour de Babel, which is a music festival that usually happens in uh, March, April. So it's a world music, jazz, and contemporary music festival. Uh, so for three weeks each spring, throughout the global, uh, Grenoble urban area, uh, you can uh, attend 80 concerts and shows um, that are shown at more than 40 venues in 20 towns uh, in the whole department. Uh, so like, yeah, they offer many performances, shows, uh, branches as well, living room concerts, so like concert with very limited attendance. Uh, they organize arts, uh, they make art, in, art installations, sorry, uh, organize panels and workshops. So like, yeah, this festival is quite comprehensive. Uh, then there's the Street Art Grenoble, Grenoble Alp, uh, which happens every spring or summer for about a month. Uh, and so it happens mainly in Grenoble and the direct surrounding cities. 
Its first edition was in 2015, and uh, it's been inviting local and international artists to create some murals uh, in the city of Grenoble and around. It's actually quite fun because you can attend some um, live creation of murals. You can uh, attend. You can go to some exhibitions about for, um, previous. Uh, editions or topics related to the current um, festival. Uh, you can follow some tours as well organized by the festival to take you to the different murals that have been created throughout the years. And like, yeah, it's in Grenoble is very good for street arts, I have to say. Uh, then uh, the Fête des Tuiles, so the Day of the Tiles, has been uh, a celebration that has started in 2015. So it happens on one day, early June. And so over there you can see some parades, uh, performances in the street, concerts, uh, workshops. And so this day uh, is paying tribute to the riots that took place on June 7th, 1788 against the royal forces who wanted to block the Dauphiné Parliament's powers. And this day has been seen as a prelude to the French Revolution, uh, which happened a few months after. And so, yeah, during that day, uh, civilians threw tiles on the soldiers, hence the, the name of the, of the celebration. And then the Rencontre Cine Montagne, so is a mountain film festival, which is actually the biggest of its kind in Europe in terms of attendance. Each year, uh, this festival attracts more than 20,000 spectators. So it's, as I said, uh, a film festival, so uh, focused on mountains. So it offers five screening nights, along with uh, lectures, conversations, and different workshops about hiking, climbing, and just like ways to enjoy the mountains. All right, when it comes to food, uh, so the most typical dish that you can have in Grenoble is the gratin dauphinois, which is a dish made of sliced potatoes baked in milk or cream with garlic and nutmeg, and it's very comforting in, in winter. So uh, fun fact, the world record of the biggest gratin dauphinois uh, was made, uh, sorry, was broken in, sorry. Let me say that again. So like, yeah, uh, the world record of the biggest gratin dauphinois ever made was of 23 square meters, about 250 square feet uh, in Grenoble on October 8, 2022. So I have a question for you. What quantity of potatoes was used to make it? So Sam, you can use the chat, you can unmute yourself. So like, yeah, do you have an idea of how much potatoes were used to make the, the biggest gratin dauphinois in the world? Ten tons, ah, a bit less than that. <laughs> so no, it was not 10 tons, but it was actually 1,500 kilograms of potatoes. So that's about uh, 3,000 pounds. So like, yeah, less than 10,000, but still like a lot of potatoes to eat. So alongside this quantity of potatoes, they used 350 liters of cream and one, kilos, uh, one kilo of garlic. A uh, second dish that is very popular in the area is raviol. So they are like very tiny, tiny uh, ravioli uh, with a feeling of Comté or French Emmental cheese. Uh, with which you can mix with uh, cottage cheese, uh, butter, and parsley. So this dish is very, very old because it was already made uh, in the Roman ages. Uh, the feeling evolved from uh, vegetables to cheese in the 19th century. And so at first, this dish was made for mostly celebrations and prepared by um, raviolos, who were raviol specialists most of the time women, who actually went from house to house to uh, make the raviol. So now the process is uh, industrialized um, and it's been so since the 1950s. 
then in, you can, as for cheese, you can try the Bleu de Sassenage. So it's a mild, natural wine, cow milk, blue cheese produced in the Verco Mountains. And as dessert, you can try a Dauphinois, which is a walnut cake made with walnuts from Grenoble. Um, and so, yeah, it's a kind of pie uh, filled with honey, caramel, and uh, walnut cream or curd. And to help you digest a nice meal, you can either try Chartreuse or Genepi. So may, you may have heard about Chartreuse because surprisingly enough for me, uh, I, it's very easy to find in the US. I'm very surprised by that. Uh, so Chartreuse is a herbal liqueur produced in the second half of the, of the 18th century by Chartreux monks close to Grenoble. They produce it in the Chartreuse mountain. And so the funny thing about Chartreuse is that so it's a very old recipe that has been uh, actually created in the 16th century, but it was not used. Then those monks found out about it and so started to create this liqueur in the 18th century. And only three monks know the recipe. And even though the process to make Chartreuse is industrialized, uh, still only those three monks know the exact recipe to make it. So it's basically made of 130 different kinds of herbs and plants. So like yeah, only those three monks know the exact uh, proportion to make the chartreuse. They basically send their blend to the factory and the factory makes it with alcohol. But like, yeah, the factory doesn't know exactly the composition of the, um, of the chartreuse. Uh, so you can find either green or yellow chartreuse, which basically the same uh, use the same ingredients, but in different proportions. The green chartreuse is stronger. It's about 55% uh, of alcohol, and the yellow one is 43% of alcohol. And Genepi on its side, uh, so is another herbal liqueur, herbal liqueur, but this one is made from uh, the blend, which name is Genepi as well. Um, so this plant, you can find it in the mountains, like the Alps, the Pyrenees, or even in South America. And if you want to try, you can make your own Genepi at home, following the 40 rules, which basically is you have to use 40 strands of Genepi that you macerate for 40 days in one liter of 40 degree alcohol with 40 cubes of sugar. If you ever want to try that, I never did but maybe you can try it if you go to the Alps to find some Genepi. And then we're going to Andai. So from the Les Antilles, we then went to the Alps and now we're going to the very southwest of France. So this is a view over the city. Uh, so Andai is the France's most southwesterly city. It's at the border with Spain and it's located in the French Basque Country. So if we take back the map again, so the Basque Country in France covers about that area. It's so the Basque Country is uh, so there's a French Basque Country and a Spanish Basque Country, and the Basque Country in Spain is way larger than the the one in France. But still, uh, so actually this year, uh, the actual uh, Tour de France, so the cycling race will uh, go through Andai for the first time in, I think, a few, few years. Um, <clears throat> so as I said, Andai is located in the Basque Country. And so uh, the, the region has, uh, quite a few specificities. So for example, in Basque country, the people can speak quite a different language because Basque uh, is actually, uh, doesn't rely either on or French or Spanish. So it's very different from, from, from French. Like you, if you speak French, I mean, I speak French and I'm really not able to understand Basque at all. Like the roots are completely different. Uh, the architecture of the in the Basque Country is quite uh, specific as well. So over there, you will find a lot of white houses with uh, colored timber. 
timber, sorry. And uh, in the Basque country as well, you can see people uh, doing some very unusual activities, I would say. Um, so they have country games that were related to farm activities like wood cutting, like stone lifting. Uh, they also have quite a few traditional dances that uh, people perform during Basque celebrations. Uh, and they play uh, Basque pelota as well. So Basque pelota is a, I'm oh, sorry, is a very specific uh, sport. And it would take me a, quite a bit of time to uh, send you the, sorry, it would take me quite a bit of time to explain you the rules. So at the end of the presentation, uh, I will send you a link so that I, you have a good idea uh, of what French uh, Basque pelota looks like. Uh, if you ever think about taking the Camino de Santiago de Compostela, you can actually pass by Andai because one of the routes is actually uh, passing by this part of France. And as you could see on the first picture you saw of Andai, so there's a beach which is uh, quite a popular seaside resort. So like, yeah, to start with the beach, uh, so Andai's beach is actually three, kilom three kilometer long, about two mile long, and it's the longest beach uh, in the in the Basque in the French Basque Country. Uh, and you can see all along the coast of the Basque Country uh, quite a few beaches uh, that extend until uh, Biarritz and uh, Anglet. Uh, so the beaches in the French Basque Country are very popular for nautical sports such as surfing, paddling, kayaking. Um, and so yeah, the beach at Andai is actually quite good if you want to try uh, surfing for the first time because as it's uh, bay shaped, uh, there are a bit less waves, so it's less difficult to start. Uh, I mean, it's, it's less rough to start surfing in Andai. And so I went to Andai only one day in my life, but I, uh, I will remember, I hope forever. Because um, so yeah, I, I went there with some friends and I stayed in the water so long because the water was just so warm. It was, it was so nice. Uh, I think I stayed like 45 minutes to like one hour in the water and I just couldn't see the time flying because I was just feeling so well in this warm water. That was very unexpected, especially knowing that uh, the Atlantic coast is known for like, his, it's like cold, colder water than the Mediterranean, but like, yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. All right. Uh, so if you go to the Basque Country, you can uh, see the Abadia Castle as well. So it's a castle that was built between 1864 and 1884. Um, so it has a neo-Gothic style that was inspired by a medieval castle. So it belonged to Antoine d'Abadi, a scholar who was fond of the Basque culture. Uh, actually, in 1836, uh, together with uh, Augustin Chao, he published a book called Grammar Studies on the Basque Language, and he later launched Basque Festival in uh, Urugne, the neighboring village of uh, Andai. So Antoine d'Abadi uh, was born in Dublin. His uh, mother was Irish, but his father was Basque. And I think that's from his father that he, he became very fond of the Basque culture. And that's why he, uh, he decided to um, migrate to the Basque country. So uh, this scholar uh, was very fond of different things like geography and astronomy. Uh, he was so fond of astronomy that he actually built an, an observatory that was in operation until 1979. And uh, Antoine d'Abedi lived also in Ethiopia for 11 years. So if you go to the castle inside, you will see a lot of decorations inspired by uh, Ethiopian cultures. 
so when he died, he bequeathed his castle to the Academy of Sciences. So he was actually the president of the Academy of Sciences, I think in 1892. And so yeah, the Academy of Sciences still owns the, the castle. Um, and he was actually buried with his wives in the chapel crypts. So you can probably see his stone uh, if you go to the Abadia castle. Uh, a very nice thing that you could do as well is just like tra travel to some cute villages uh, in the Basque country, like Sar, Ainoa, and Espelette. So Sar and Ainoa are listed among the most beautiful friend villages. So there's an actual label um, in France that exists uh, that yeah are given to very very pretty uh, villages in France. Uh, so Sa and Aino are located more uh, in the closer to the mountains than um, than Andai. And if you want to go from uh, Sa to Ainoa and you want to take a hike, there's actually a hiking trail that goes from the two villages. It takes about two hours and 45 minutes to uh, hike from Sa to Ainoa. You can check as well Espelette, which is a famous uh, that has been made famous thanks to the cultivation of a specific pepper called the Espelette pepper. So this one was actually uh, cultivated at first in Mexico and was brought to the Basque country um, and then was brought to the Basque country. And since then, uh, it's been cultivated in Espelette. Uh, and Ainoa and Espelette are as well on the route of Santiago de Compostela. Uh, the villages are on different routes. Uh, so Ainoa is on the Baston route and Espelette is on the Bidasora road. So if you want to take the Camino, you may have to, to choose uh, one of the two villages to, to visit. Or maybe you can just do a little detour and go back to, to your trail after that. So yeah, so this was Ainoa. So as I mentioned earlier, so here is a very uh, good example of the um, Basque architecture, so like yeah, with the white facade and the very gold timber. And this is Sar, and so this is Espelette. So you can here you can see the the Espelette pepper drying on the on the wall of this house. So Espelette pepper is not very spicy. It's not uh, I mean it's not spicy in the sense that it's not very hot, but it has it's as hot as regular black pepper so it's not spicy at all uh, but it has a very specific flavor uh, a bit roasted and it's it's very delicious it's i i don't think unfortunately that you can find that in the u.s but yeah it's uh it has a very peculiar taste and then so you can aim to the Otubi castle, which belongs to the same family since its construction in 1341. So yeah, uh, that's quite unusual, but yeah, the, the same uh, family has been owning this castle since, in, since its construction. So among the uh, notable people who stayed at this castle, you can find uh, King Louis XI, who spent the night in 1463. So if you go to this castle, you can see a collection of tapestries from the 16th to the 18th century, as well as portraits of the family ancestors. Um, so a six uh, hectare, uh, 15 acres English style garden uh, was created in the seven in the 18th century, sorry. Uh, and the chapel was built in the 17th century. So this castle received the label of historical monument in 1974. And so even though um, the hotel is now a castle, you can still absolutely visit it. Like it's different uh, rooms, uh, at least part of the castle, uh, the whole park, as well as the orangerie. So I mentioned Basque celebrations, Basque celebration before. So some that you can maybe try to go to is the Big Chincho. 
so it's a weekend long, uh, usually in February, uh, celebrates Saint Vincent, Saint Vincent Paul, and uh, as well as the return of the best privateer Etienne Pelot to Andai. So to celebrate those three events, uh, those two people and events, some uh, temporadas are organized. So those are parades with drums, as well as traditional dances. There's a fair, there are shows and performances, uh, pelot mm, games. Uh, there's the Andai Fetlete Festival. Uh, so it's a three-day festival of performing arts, circus, and pyrotechnics to celebrate summer in Andai. Uh, the Fête du Chipiron uh, is uh, a dinner, usually, that happens mid-July with a menu dedicated to Chipiron, so squid. Uh, so if you go there, you can try squid in cooked in very different ways, uh, like a la plancha with sauces, like and a lot of different recipes. So people just like put tables in the street, you can hear traditional music. And usually the uh, Chipiron dishes are cooked by nonprofit organization, they, their staff and their volunteers. And then the Oscal Besta and Iri Besta. So uh, it's usually happening in the second weekend of August. So the Oscal Besta, the celebration of the Basque culture, has been celebrated since 1930. And the Iri Besta is the city center party, has been created in 2004. So those two festivities have been brought together uh, to celebrate the Basque culture with parades, traditional music, sport activities and dances. So. Uh, what I mentioned before uh, with like unusual, I would say activities like stone lifting and wood cutting. So those events would be perfect times to uh, see some demonstrations of those activities. Uh, and so Oscar Besta and Iri Besta usually end with uh, fireworks and a huge ball. And so this is an example of temporada so buried with drums. And so food from the best country. So first you could try chioro. So it's a fish soup, a uh, specialty of saint jean de luz so a, a city very close to Andai. Uh, so it's made with hake or other fish, depending on the fishing season. Uh, it can be made with some shellfish as well, cooked in a stock with olive oil. Uh, white wine, tomato, red bell pepper, herbs, and piment d'espelette. It used to be a fisherman dish, like the marmitaco, which uh, basically means from the marmite, uh, from the marmite. So it's a fish stew with tuna, potatoes, onions, peppers, and, tomat and tomatoes. Um, it was as well eaten by Basque fishermen during uh, fishing season. It's a very popular dish. Um, that can be that's um, often uh, prepared in some cooking competitions uh, during Basque celebrations. The piperad is uh, made of onion, uh, green peppers, and tomatoes, so it is and flavored with espelet pepper. So it can be served with eggs, meats, or fish. And if you cook it with chicken, you will have a poulet basquez. And finish with, so the Basque cake, which uh, in, I will try to pronounce it in Basque. I think it's Echeco Biscocha, which means cake from home. So it's a cake filled with either black cherry jam or almond or vanilla custard. All right, so that's it for today. Um, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself, you can uh, ask them in the chat, I would be happy to try to answer them. Uh, so yeah, in any case, our next stops will be the Ile de Ré, Joyeuse and Kourou. So yeah, if you have any, any questions or comments or... I realized that this one was a bit longer than the, than the two previous ones, but yeah, there were a lot to talk about. Uh, so yeah, if you 
if you have uh, questions that come to your mind uh, after I close this, oh yeah, I was going to send you the link to for you to see what Pilot Basque looks like. So feel free to watch it like anytime you want. You don't have to watch it now, but like yeah, you will have a a better understanding of uh, of what that game is about. I would say it's like a mix of squash and baseball with like a very specific glove. Can you fly into Grenoble internationally? I don't think so. I think the closest airport from Grenoble would be from, uh, so you could fly to Geneva and take a train from Geneva to Grenoble. Maybe you could try to fly to Lyon, but from the US, I don't think there are direct flights. But like yeah, my like the the best international airport, like the closest international airport from Grenoble, I think would be in Geneva and maybe in Marseille. But even Marseille is a bit far away. So yeah, I would say Geneva. Yeah, Geneva is the closest international airport to if you want to go to Grenoble. And then it's like a one hour and a half uh, train ride, so it's it's doable. Yeah. My pleasure. And yeah, to travel from Grenoble to Andai, I think it would be like quite a few hours of train, but but yeah, I think that would still be doable, yeah. All right, so yeah, if you have any questions that uh, you don't think about now, but that might pop up after, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can send an email to the ref staff email and my colleagues will gladly transmit and transmit your questions to me. And yeah, I can try to answer you as best as I can. Otherwise, I will uh, tell you have a good week and see you next Wednesday. So as I say, to talk about the Ile de Ré, Joyeuse and Kourou. All right. So yeah, thank you everyone for attending again. And yeah, see you next week. <laughs>